Good morning, everyone. Uh, let's just begin in prayer together. <laughs> that is my name, in case you didn't know. Let's pray. Father, what a gift it is to, um, on each uh, day of the week, on our Sabbath, we get to come and worship you together with your people. Um, we thank you for the gift of Sabbath, and we thank you for uh, what you will teach us this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, as someone said, my name is Dan, uh, in case you're new or visiting. Um, I serve as one of the pastors here at Granville Chapel. And uh, this morning, I'd like to begin uh, by asking each of us uh, a question. And uh, the question is this. How would you describe yourself to someone who didn't know you? Uh, what words, what adjectives would you use to describe yourself? Now, as you think about that, um, some of us might say we're a bit quiet or, or shy. Uh, others might describe themselves as energetic or passionate or serious or ambitious. But what words would you use? How would you describe yourself? Sorry, I'm just going to grab a drink of water here. Now, the passage that uh, Heather just read for us uh, came from Matthew chapter 12. Uh, but just before that, in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus describes himself. He tells the people what he is like. And here are the words that Jesus uses to describe who he is. Jesus uses the words gentle and humble. Here's the, the full passage. So Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11, he says, come to me all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. Now, this passage is interesting because it's one of the few instances where Jesus actually describes his own personality and character. And Jesus chooses to use the words humble and gentle to describe himself. Now, we're in a teaching series on the fruit of the Spirit, and the overarching idea that we talked about many weeks ago now was the idea of growing in Christ-likeness. And in the book that we're using um, by an author named Christopher Wright, he says, what the Spirit of God does is to make those who put their faith in Jesus to become more and more like the Jesus they love, trust, and follow. I also like this quote from a pastor called John Stott, and John writes, God wants his people to become like Christ. Christ-likeness is the will of God for the people of God. So with this in mind and knowing that Jesus describes himself as being gentle and humble, the question that we should ask ourselves is, are we gentle and humble? When others and when the world looks at you and me, do they see something of Christ in us? Do they see his gentleness and his humility in us? Because God's will is that we would become like his son, Jesus. God's will is that we, like Jesus, would be gentle and humble in heart. Now, back in April and May of this past year, uh, we did a whole sermon series on the theme of humility, 
So we're not going to address that topic this morning, but we will be talking today about the theme of gentleness. And uh, gentleness is the eighth aspect of the fruit of the Spirit found in Galatians 5. And as we talk about gentleness today, I think a good place to start is by first talking about what gentleness is not. Because sometimes we can have a misunderstanding of words and ideas that is based more on culture or based more on our upbringing than it is the actual biblical idea. So in order for us to have the Bible's understanding of gentleness, let's first clarify what gentleness is not. So first, gentleness is not weakness. Gentleness is not weakness. And to prove that, all we have to do is look at the life of Jesus. So was Jesus gentle? Yes, Jesus was incredibly gentle, and we see many instances in his life where that gentleness is displayed. But did this gentleness mean that Jesus was weak? And the answer is no. Jesus was not weak. In fact, Jesus displayed a life that was full of power, courage, and strength. Jesus was gentle, but he was not weak. And we see this played out in our passage today in Matthew chapter 12. So let me quickly recap uh, what we just read. So the passage uh, begins... On a Sabbath day, which was meant to be a day of rest from work. Now, Sabbath was a gift from God, representing the pattern of life that God had set for humanity. So God himself, he rested one day out of seven during his work of creation. And so likewise, human beings were meant to rest one day of seven from our work. Now, a quick side note. Uh, I think when it talks about work, I think this includes resting from work professionally and also resting from work personally uh, and, and working around the home. So God wants us to have at least one day of rest a week where we can truly rest and not be doing a bunch of errands or, or work around the home. So Sabbath is a gift from God, a good day of rest from work. Now, the problem is that the Pharisees, uh, the religious leaders of the day, they had taken this uh, commandment and taken it to an extreme that was never intended by God. So in our passage, we see the Pharisees condemn Jesus and his disciples for working because they picked grain and ate it because they were hungry. Uh, We also see the Pharisees condemn Jesus for working as he helps and heals a man with a shriveled hand. So the Pharisees take the Sabbath, something that is good, and they twist it into something that is oppressive and a burden for God's people. Now, there we read a big chunk of scripture this morning, so there's a lot in there. But for today, I just want to focus on on certain things. So here's what I want to draw out from the passage for us. The Pharisees, they were the religious and political leaders of the people of Israel. They had authority over people, their way of life, and their way of worship. And yet, although Jesus was a gentle person, Jesus shows great strength and power as he openly defies the teaching of the Pharisees. You can be a gentle person, but at the same time, be strong and bold and courageous. So gentleness is not weakness. And here's another thing that gentleness is not. Gentleness is not always being nice. We can see this again from our passage today. Jesus not only defies the Pharisees, 
but he essentially humiliates them in public for all to see. That's why it says that the Pharisees plotted to kill Jesus. He was not just disagreeing with them, but Jesus was making a mockery of them and their teaching. Now let's be clear. There are many nicer ways that Jesus could have gone about things. There are ways to respectfully disagree with others, and I think for most situations in life, that is the approach that we should take. But there are also certain situations where niceness is not the appropriate response. For example, if somebody broke into your house and they were determined to do harm to you and your family, I think we're all agreed that that is not the time to be nice. Or think of times in history when governments or, or people groups have persecuted uh, or enslaved uh, others based on race or ethnicity or religion. When that happens, should we simply seek to be nice and respectfully disagree? Or does that demand a more stronger and a more forceful response? So in the same way, Jesus, though he is gentle at heart, does not respond to the situation in his day with niceness. God's people are being oppressed by wicked, corrupt, and false teachers. And instead of seeking to be nice, Jesus rebukes them with force and strength. Now at this point, I think it's important for us to pause and to consider what kind of picture of Jesus do we have? Because I think sometimes we can have an incomplete picture of Jesus and who he was and what he actually was like. I think some of us might have a picture of Jesus that was just nice all the time. But this simply is not true. This is not how the scriptures portray who Jesus is. So for example, in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus gives a scathing rebuke to the Pharisees, and he does not hold back at all. Now, I wish I could read the whole passage, but in addition to being scathing, it's also a very long rebuke, so it just would take too long to read. And here's just some of what Jesus says. He says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You blind guides, you blind fools. You are like whitewashed tombs. You appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. You snakes, you brood of vipers. How will you escape being condemned to hell? Now, not only does Jesus rebuke the Pharisees, but Jesus also rebukes and pronounces judgment on entire cities. So in Matthew chapter 11, it says, Then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. And of course, there is also the well-known story of Jesus flipping tables. So we read in Mark chapter 11. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. 
He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. Just picture that scene. Just a person going to a temple, overturning everything, and physically stopping people from entering because they're trying to do something that was wrong. So as we can see, Jesus did not always act in ways that were nice. But he was always good. Jesus always stood for what was good and what was right and what was true. And in certain situations like the ones that we just read, Jesus acted and spoke with great power, with boldness, with courage, and with strength. Now, what does this mean for us? Does that mean that we should go around rebuking people, pronouncing judgments, and flipping tables? According to the scriptures, there may be times, (laughs) there may be certain situations when God doesn't call us to niceness but rather God may call us to godly courage, to boldness, and to strength. Let me share um, a quick story of something that happened to me when I was in my early 20s. So uh, it was during the summertime, and uh, some of my friends and I decided to go to this special church service, uh, special event for young adults. Uh, So we went, and uh, there was the usual time of singing and worship, Uh, and then instead of a sermon or a message that day, uh, they were interviewing a uh, a local Christian uh, business leader, and uh, this person happened to be quite successful in selling high-end fashion shoes. Uh, So the interview started, and uh, it started out fine, but... uh, yeah, the interview started out fine, and you know, they were asking this business leader about you know, their faith and their prayer life. It was all good. But then the subject changed uh, to this person's you know, high-end, fashionable shoe business, uh, which was a little bit strange. Uh, but as the interview continued, it just continued to focus on this person's shoe business. And then all of a sudden, they brought on five or six models on stage wearing his shoes. And then they just started talking about the shoes. So my friends and I were shocked at what was taking place. I couldn't really understand what was going on. They were doing exactly what Jesus had said shouldn't happen in the church. And as the shoe commercial and advertisement continued on stage, my friends and I just looked at each other and we agreed that we should leave. Now we didn't flip any tables on the way out, but very firmly, we all stood up, our row stood up, and we just walked out. Now, was that a nice thing to do? Probably not. We could have been nice and and polite and and just stayed through it like the hundreds of others were doing. But something in our hearts and spirits knew that what was happening was not right. You don't sell merchandise in church. And me and my friends and the hundreds of others who went to church to that, to that event, we didn't go there to learn about this person's shoe business. We went there to learn about Jesus, to know him better, to, to learn how to walk with him. And the Holy Spirit compelled us to forgo niceness that day, and we walked out and... We had an amazing little worship gathering of our own where we talked about scripture, what we had just experienced, 
why that was not right. Okay, so we've talked a, a decent amount about uh, what gentleness is not. So gentleness is not weakness, and gentleness is not seeking always to be nice. So let's talk about now what gentleness is. And to do that, uh, we'll continue our passage from Matthew chapter 12. So here, uh, as we continue on, uh, this is a description of Jesus uh, through the prophetic words of Isaiah. So it says about Jesus, here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out, till he has brought justice through to victory. And in his name, the nations will put their hope. Now I'd like to focus on those two phrases, a bruised reed and a smoldering wick. And to help us understand what this passage is getting at, I just wanna show us an image of a bruised reed. Now, in ancient times, uh, reeds could be used for all sorts of different things. Uh, they could be used as writing pens, uh, or reeds could be bunched together to, to make mats or, or weaved into baskets. And there were even very large and very strong single reeds that could be used as walking sticks. Now, in the Old Testament, uh, there are references to certain nations, such as Israel or Egypt, as being like bruised reeds or, or shaking reeds. And when it comes to the second uh, metaphor of a smoldering wick, this calls to mind Jesus' teaching that God's people were supposed to be the light of the world. They were to be a source of light to others. So when this passage talks about a bruised reed and a smoldering wick, this is referring to people. It's referring to people who, like a bruised reed, feel broken and damaged. It's talking about people who, like a smoldering wick, feel like the light in their life is flickering and about to go out. And here we are told that Jesus will not break a bruised reed nor will he snuff out a smoldering wick. Jesus is gentle towards those who are weak and broken. So here is the first thing we can learn about gentleness from Jesus. Gentleness is caring for the weak and the broken. Now I know this might seem obvious, but I think it can actually be quite difficult to faithfully live this out in our lives. I think for most of us, it's quite easy to care for someone once or twice or maybe three times. But if someone continues in their struggles and is in need of help again and again and again, it can be difficult to continue to be gentle and caring. During the pandemic, uh, before I came on staff here at Granville, uh, I worked in a long-term care facility uh, with seniors that had chronic long-term illnesses. So physically, emotionally, mentally, it was filled with, with these seniors who were weak and broken. Now, I wasn't involved in direct care for the seniors. I was more on the kind of financial and business side of things. But I did work closely alongside the care team, 
the nurses and, and the care aides. And when I first got there, honestly, I was pretty surprised at what appeared to me as a lack of gentleness, a lack of caring, a lack of compassion from the care staff towards the seniors. But then as I began to work there, day after day, seeing tremendous need all the time, I felt myself becoming less compassionate and less caring towards those in need. We have um, a term in our culture called compassion fatigue, where those who are in helping professions can experience uh, this callousness, this fatigue, uh, and a wide range of symptoms due to the cost of constantly caring for others who are in need. And of course, we can experience this not only in our workplace, but we can experience this in our personal lives as well. We might have a friend or a family member who is struggling with something long-term, and over time, it can be difficult to have the same level of gentleness and the same level of care that we once used to have. But look what it says in Ephesians chapter 4. We are told, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Gentleness is connected with patience. We are to care for others and continue to care for others with patience, bearing with one another in love. We are not to give up on relationships or friendships because things become too hard. And again, our example for this kind of gentle and patient and enduring love is found in the life of Jesus. You see, there was someone very close to Jesus who became a bruised reed. There was someone in Jesus' close circle of friends who became like a smoldering wick. And this person was the disciple, Peter. You see, on the night that Jesus was betrayed and arrested, all the disciples failed Jesus. In Mark 14, it says, everyone deserted him and fled. But only one of the disciples actively and repeatedly denied and disowned Jesus, and that was Peter. In fact, Peter denies and disowns Jesus three times, and after the third time, it says that Peter went out by himself and he wept bitterly. Peter weeps and he grieves over what he has done and he becomes a broken man. He becomes like a bruised weed, a bruised reed, a smoldering wick. The light of his life was flickering and going out. But then what does Jesus do? A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. Jesus heals the bruised and the broken, and Jesus brings light again to those whose light has gone out. So let's Take some time now to see how Jesus brings this healing and restoration to Peter. And uh, to do that, we'll look at John chapter 21. But before we read, let me just set the scene for what we're about to read. So the resurrection has taken place. Uh, Jesus has already appeared to his disciples twice, but it's still early days. And uh, Jesus hasn't made clear to the disciples what they're supposed to do next. So the disciples at this point, they're kind of just hanging around, not doing much. So one night, 
uh, Peter and some other disciples, they decide to go fishing. And they go fishing all night, but they catch nothing. So then we'll pick up the story uh, in verse four. So it says, early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. So he called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards away. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to Simon, he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Now, what, what are we seeing here? What is taking place? Well, first, we see Jesus do the exact same miracle that he did when he first called Peter to follow him. This was the exact same way uh, that Peter was called years ago. He had spent all night fishing, caught nothing, and then when Jesus tells him to put down the nets one more time, there is a miracle of this massive catch of fish. So Jesus reminds Peter of his original calling and his original commitment that he had made to follow Jesus. Next, Jesus prepares breakfast for them and he invites them to eat with him. Then after eating together, Jesus asks Peter the same question three times. And he asks him, do you love me? Essentially, Jesus is giving Peter the opportunity to undo his three denials of Jesus, which had caused him so much grief and shame. And each time, as Peter affirms his love for Jesus, Jesus' response is, feed my lambs, Take care of my sheep. Feed my sheep. So as Peter speaks out his love and commitment to Jesus, Jesus in turn speaks out to Peter his calling, his purpose, and makes clear the good work that Jesus is entrusting and calling Peter to do. Jesus takes Peter, this bruised reed and this smoldering wick, and he gently brings about restoration and healing 
and hope. Jesus gently restores Peter, and in the same way, Jesus gently restores us. I want to bring back that picture of the bruised reed. And I think that there could be some of us this morning who feel like this bruised reed. Maybe like Peter, we have done things in our past that we are ashamed of. And we think, oh, that's it. God could never use me. There's no hope for my life. There's no hope for my future. Or maybe it's not so much what we have done, but more so what's been done to us. Life and the pain and the difficulties of living in a fallen world have taken their toll. And we feel like our lives are broken and bruised and damaged. And we might feel like we're barely hanging on. And if you live long enough, there will come a time when we all feel like this. It's inevitable. But no matter how many times we, like Peter, may feel like we've done things that God can't forgive, and that God can't use us. And no matter what this world and this life may throw at us, we have a constant source of hope and a constant source of help in Jesus. Jesus has compassion and he cares for those who are weak and hurting and broken. And Jesus is able. He is able to gently restore and bring healing and hope. He is able to restore to us our sense of purpose, our sense of calling. And as we affirm our commitment to Jesus, God graciously gives and entrusts to us good work to do as part of his kingdom. And he gives and he fills our lives with purpose and meaning and hope. Jesus is our gentle savior, our gentle God and king who patiently and faithfully cares for us. A bruised reed he will not break. In a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. Till he has brought justice through to victory. And in his name the nations will put their hope. As we close up the message for this morning, I just want to give an opportunity, if there is anyone here who has not uh, given their life to Jesus. Uh, Or maybe, you know, like me, when I was a teenager, you've grown up in the church, but you haven't made that decision for yourself to follow him. I just want to create an opportunity and space for you to be able to do that for the first time this morning. Or maybe you have followed Jesus but uh, you are feeling like a bruised reed in a smoldering wick. And for you, I just want to give you an invitation as well to once again to have faith and to believe that Jesus, there's nothing that he cannot restore or redeem in your life. And going back to that first group, uh, if you've never made that decision to follow Jesus, uh, a very simple prayer you could pray in the next few moments is a prayer that I prayed and, and I've since learned 
Countless others have prayed, and the prayer is this. God, if you're real, then would you please help me? And for me and countless others, God has answered and responded to that prayer. So let's, let's just pray together now. Father in heaven, we thank you for uh, these words of truth and hope that you have given to us this morning. Jesus is our gentle Savior, God and King, who restores and brings healing and the light to our lives. Father, the truth is that apart from you, we are all bruised reeds and smoldering wicks. And so I pray that each and every single one of us would experience your gentle healing, mercy, and grace in our lives. And as we experience this, may we be transformed. As we experience your gentleness, Lord, may we ourselves grow in gentleness so that we can participate in your good work in bringing healing and hope and redemption to this world. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, we have the privilege and opportunity to take communion together. And uh, in communion, we get to remember and celebrate uh, God's love for us. So the scriptures, they tell us that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. At Granville Chapel, we welcome all followers of Jesus uh, to join us in taking communion. And again, for those who have not yet made a decision to follow Christ, Jesus invites you and offers to you his healing and forgiveness. And if you would like to make that decision this morning, you are welcome to come and take communion as your first step in committing to follow him. At this time, I'd like to invite the ushers to please come forwards and to prepare the two communion stations at the front. And then uh, starting with the front rows, uh, just come through the outside aisles, take communion. Uh, You can return your, your empty cup to the center of the table and return to your seats. For those with gluten allergies, you can ask your server just for a gluten free option and they'll be happy to provide one for you. And uh, lastly, if for whatever reason you're not physically able to make your way to the front, uh, just when the lineup finishes, just raise your hand and the servers will be glad to come and serve you. So now as we uh, approach the Lord's table, uh, I invite you to stand and to prepare to take communion. And uh, I'll say a word of prayer. Jesus, we thank you again for your great love for us. We thank you for dying for our sins that we might be forgiven and cleansed and made new. Thank you for being our gentle savior. 